Good morning, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our worship service this morning. Um, you've already missed one great worship service at 8.30, but we're glad that you're here for the 11 o'clock service. This might be the first opportunity that some of you have had to worship here at the chapel, and if it is, we want to recognize you. Would you simply raise your hand as our ushers will give you a highly valuable yellow sticker for you to take home and to keep forever? If this is your first time, would you raise your hand, please? And those of you who are part of the uh, chapel, be sure that you um, make our visitors feel that they have indeed come home, because that's what the way we want everyone to feel. Let me remind our finance committee and the um, trustee executive committee, there's a meeting at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock respectively on Tuesday. If you're a part of those groups, please make your plans to be here. And then the Red Cross will be holding their blood drive here on June the 22nd, Wednesday the 22nd. If you would like to donate, please go to their website, make your appointment, so that you can indeed give the gift of life. <clears throat> and also, it was mentioned last week, and I want to uh, have you to save the date for July the 3rd. We're going to have a wonderful musical here. It's called A Salute to America, where we remember and give thanks for all the blessings that we have enjoyed as the United States. It'll be a wonderful time with brass and wonderful songs and makes your heart pump and maybe even give you a goose pimple or two. But it'll be great to be here, 3 o'clock, July the 3rd, Sunday, July the 3rd. You can come to our concert, then go up to the concert up at the bridge, not miss a thing in the whole community. We're looking forward to seeing you then, so uh, bring your friends and your neighbors and um, as I once said, you can even bring some people you don't particularly like. Just bring them, and um, we'll all enjoy this uh, patriotic concert. We are glad that you are here on this day. <clears throat> and now, if you would look in your, in your bulletin, we will read responsibly our call to worship. The word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all their host by the breath of his mouth. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to naught. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. May we go to the Lord in prayer, please. It's a special time, Lord, as we take a part of this week to come into this quiet place where we can meditate on your goodness, we can remember the way that you have graced us so that we can give you thanks. We are thankful for the way that we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and ask for you to bless this time together. We're thankful that we have this time to reflect and now we ask that your spirit be in this hour so that we may go away saying it was good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And now would you turn in your hymnal to hymn number 349 as we sing together to God be the glory. Please stand as we sing.
back a uh, folder of your hymnal is the Apostles Creed. May we recite that together now, please. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Seed by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, in however way you feel comfortable, please greet those that are around you this morning. Let them know you're glad they're here in God's house with you.
Today's scripture lesson comes from Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. And you might find it in the Pew Bibles on page 1605, 1605. This reading for Trinity Sunday mentions in the space of five verses, God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Now hear these words. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith in this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The words of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Now please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving and intercession. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this another glorious, wonderful day. And as we celebrate this Trinity Sunday, Almighty God, we give thanks for your help in expanding our experience and understanding of the God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we worship today on this day. Thank you for our many blessings and help us, Father, to help those who have lost loved ones, those that are sick and shut in, and those that are less fortunate than we. Father, we pray and ask all these things in Jesus' holy name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Come all Christians, be committed. Hymn 488. Please stand together as we sing.
we pray, please? Lord, you know how good it is when many small gifts come together. And all our gifts are small compared to the grandeur of your gift to us. Increase the measure of our love so that our offerings may worthily proclaim your name to the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
those of you who may not know Dr. Michael Cogdell, I am happy to introduce him to you. He has been coming here for many years and has many dear and close friends already here, and most of you already know him. But um, he is the founding dean of the Divinity School at Campbell University and has uh, steered that to being a wonderful institution, and he deserves a great deal of credit for that and a fine professor. My first to class was his, 8 o'clock. I drove an hour and a half from Wilmington to get there. So you know he's a good professor if he makes you want to come back the next week, drive another hour and a half, and get there at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's wonderful to have him here. Uh, for the many years that I have known him, he has been uh, uh, an encourager in all situations, and he is a wonderful mentor and a great friend. We are delighted to have you, your lovely wife, Gail, and your family. We're glad to have all of you here today. Thank you, Dr. Rushing and Sandy. Thank you uh, for your leadership in this service today and uh, for your kind words. I'm very grateful to you. I once uh, had a person come to my church to preach and introduce that person much like Reggie Rushing introduced me this morning. In fact, I said he'd been coming a lot of years and he really didn't need any introduction. But what happened that Sunday morning was that he preached way past 12 o'clock. <laughs> and as I was standing at the back door with him, a person in our church uh, came by and said, our preacher was so right about you. You needed no introduction what you needed, brother, was a conclusion. <laughs> I'm going to make a promise to you this morning that I won't have to, uh, you won't have to say that about me. But thank you, Holden Beach family, for inviting me to this place. I'm flattered, honored. I look forward to it every year. I consider you part of my family, and uh, I, I look forward to seeing you. And I thank you so very much for the invitation uh, to be here today. Now, today is a very important Sunday, and I don't want any one of us to miss the importance or impact uh, of this Sunday. Most of you know that today is Trinity Sunday on the liturgical calendar, if you follow those kinds of things. But what you need to put into perspective is the seasons of the Christian year that we've been through. We've come through Lent and Easter and last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, we celebrate that knowing that God poured out the Holy Spirit in a special way on the believers. The Holy Spirit's been a part of creation since Genesis 1-1. We all know that. But on that day, it was very special. Jesus and his disciples knew that that. Uh, celebration day as Shabbat, as 50 days from the start of the Passover. But we Christians now know Pentecost Sunday as 50 days from the resurrection. We are resurrection people. That's one reason we worship on Sunday morning. If you're in uh, formal churches or have been there, you know that, <coughs> that the liturgical color of Pentecost Sunday is red. And so last Sunday, you may be in a service or in this one where the ministers wore a red stole or the liturgical colors, the paraments were red. It's only Sunday we do that, Pentecost Sunday. But now we celebrate that today the Holy Spirit is here. It's been fully manifested in our present. So today is Trinity Sunday. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit uh, all together without conflict or confusion. Now, the colors today are either white or gold. And you will notice some gold here today in these beautiful pyramids. And that means that we're celebrating the Trinity. God's Spirit is here. Now, what I want you to really get a hold of is that today is Trinity Sunday, yes, but it launches us now into a long liturgical period. It's called the time uh, of ordinary days. It's called the season after Pentecost. In some traditions, it is called the days of the church. And so I don't want any of us to miss it. We're on such a victorious day today, Trinity Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, Trinity Sunday, but we're being launched now 
into a long period that all, lasts almost to Advent uh, in the fall. Now, the color of ordinary days, red, Pentecost, white or gold for Trinity Sunday, but the color is green. Notice on our paraments this morning, on the pulpit, on the communion table, on the chancel, there is the green and gold. Now, the reason for that is green stands for growth. So once we come to Pentecost Sunday and Trinity Sunday, we're launched into the season of ordinary days, the season after Pentecost. The color is green, meaning this is the time with the Spirit fully manifested, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, we grow as disciples. We grow for this period. Now, the word disciple means learner. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you're a learner. So this is a time that we grow, that we grow. So what would be a great biblical text to, to bring forth and to read and to share with the congregation on this day when we're getting ready to be launched into this long period where we are to grow as disciples. I don't know if Paul ever thought about it in those terms. Likely not. But he sure hit the nail on the head with a scripture that I think is just the perfect scripture for today. So I don't want you to miss now the importance of this Sunday and what it launches us into as believers. And our, our scripture this morning is Ephesians 4, 25 to f chapter 5, verse 2. Now, I'm going to read all that for you in just a minute. But Paul lifts up the challenge that I think is the perfect challenge for us believers as we launch now into the, the period of ordinary days, the season after Pentecost. And here's the ch challenge, and I think it may be the highest standard in the Bible. It's certainly the only place in the Bible this phrase is used. Here's what Paul says. He challenges us for growth. Be an imitator of God. Be an imitator of God. Now that doesn't mean to think you're God. Of course not. And it doesn't mean to be arrogant thinking that you know, you're, you're near to God uh, and more than anybody else, that kind of thing. It means to act like God. It means to show forth the qualities that God shows forth. What a perfect challenge for this Sunday, Trinity Sunday, as we celebrate green and gold, and as we get ready to move now into the period of ordinary days. Now, with that in mind, it puts our scripture in perfect perspective. I want you to really listen to the last part, but I want to read this whole section for you. Ephesians 4.25 to chapter 5, verse 2. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors. For we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down. On your anger. Some of your translations may say wrath. And do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather let them labor and work honestly with their own hands. So as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths. But only what is useful for building up. For building up. So there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with a seal uh, for the day of redemption. Put away, put away all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander Together with all malice, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, 
as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Trinity Sunday, Pentecost Trinity, and now we're launched into the season of green, the season of growth. Hear this challenge. Be an imitator of God. I think this morning we're lifting up maybe the highest standard in the Bible in some degrees for disciples. To be an imitator of God. To act like God acts. And to bring forth the qualities in our lives like God has. Uh, imitation. Be an imitator of Him. Not think we are God. Now, we can do a lot with imitation. We could talk about that a lot, couldn't we? Sometimes we talk about it relationally. I bet you do in your family. You look at a son or a daughter or a grandson or a granddaughter, and you say to that person, you are the spitting image of your father. Or you are just exactly like your mother. Now, if we were standing out in the country this morning, we could... We could say it dropping the G off those I-N-G words like we do all the time and just say you're the spitting image of, of your father, of your grandmother. Every Mother's Day, I don't miss a single one. Every Mother's Day, whether I preach on it or I just highlight it, my text is always first, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. You all remember that? Paul is getting ready to pass all the work on to Timothy and Titus. And he's talking in particularly to Timothy. And it sounds like almost like a service of ordination is about to start. Because he's talking all these things to him. And then he says, don't you remember, Timothy? Before we have this service. I want you to know, Timothy. What I see in you today. I saw it in your grandmother, Lois. And what I see in you today, I also saw it in your mother, Eunice. And now, Timothy, I see it in you. And I want you to know that and to always remember that. Imitations. We certainly can talk about it relationally. Sometimes we can talk about it in terms of witness. Have you ever said in talking to other people about a friend or about a person you think is a good example? That person is the real deal. That person is authentic. That person is genuine. That person is the finest example of a Christian that I have known. Sometimes we talk about it in terms of a witness. Sometimes we just enjoy it. There are comedians on television that imitate people, and they're good at it, and whenever we get to see them, it's funny, and we laugh at those kind of things. And certainly we are aware that sometimes people give poor imitations. Our name is Christian. And we never want to give, do we? A poor imitation of being a Christian person. So Paul lifts up this great high standard in Scripture. I don't know if he ever thought about it quite like I'm trying to share it with you in terms of the, it, it is the theme for this, this period we call the ordinary days. This period when we focus on the green and reminds us of growth. Ephesus, a large city, fourth largest city in the world. Paul had gone there and established a church. He wrote to the Corinthians that they were making progress, that the, they were trying to encourage the believers not to live their lives like everybody else in the culture was. But they were making progress. Paul received a letter from the church at Corinth and said, we need you to drop what you're doing 
and come back quickly. We're, we, we need you back here. And he said, no, I cannot come. This work here is going great. I've got to stay in Ephesus at least until Pentecost. He was talking about Pentecost. And I have to stay here for the work is important. And we're trying to make progress and grow as believers for this culture needs winsome Christians in the midst of that culture. Sound familiar to you? And so we know that. Now Paul in this, in this text gives a big five things to do. Imitate God. Here are five things to do. He'll reduce it to three. But here are the five. They're pretty good. Anybody want to take... Anybody want to adopt one of these this morning? Say, I, I'm, I'm going to do that. Number one, speak the truth. Number two, put away anger. Number three, live and work honestly. Number four, put away bad language. And number five, show love and not bitterness. So he highlights... These particular five. I'm reminded every time I read this of actually another text. It's, uh, it's Romans 12. You remember we read from Romans 5 this morning. Romans 12 when Paul uh, challenges us. Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Which is your spiritual worship. That's a great challenge, isn't it? Don't, don't, don't let the culture absorb you, change you, but be a winsome input and addition to culture. But he reduces these, these to three, and I want to mention them quickly to you. Here they are. Number one, imitate God. Paul says one, one good way to do this, he brings it all down, and says, learn to practice forgiveness Daily. Learn to practice forgiveness daily. Pretty good word, isn't it? So if we adopt that this morning, this is going to be one of our markers as we leave Trinity Sunday, as we go through the season of ordinary days, that we're going to live, try to live and practice forgiveness every day. Sometimes it's hard though, isn't it? How many of you have heard the story of the husband and wife who uh, did not have a big blowout one morning, but the chemistry wasn't just right. No big argument, but uh, things just weren't, weren't all they should be. If you've been married more than 48 hours, you've probably had this happen to you sometime. No argument, no big argument, just things, you know, they just need a little distance. Uh, one needs to go work in the yard and the other one needs to do something there. Just a little distance would be good. Problem was with this couple, they had to go to a wedding that afternoon. Left at two, wedding was at three. Driving down the road, still hadn't spoken to each other much all day. And the husband was 10 and two, driving, driving. Uh, had his hands on the wheels. And uh, the wife was sitting on the passenger side in front seat, looking to her right, looking out the window. They drove about 15 minutes, and neither one of them said a word. And finally, the husband just, men, you got to watch men. The husband just blew a gasket. And they passed a field of mules. And the husband saw his wife looking out at that field of mules. And he said, relatives of yours? <laughs> and she was like, all the ladies of Holden Beach Chapel, sharp as a tack. She turned to him and said, yes, in-laws. <laughs> Practicing it is hard sometimes, isn't it? Paul said, be imitators of God. And here's one of the markers for us. To practice forgiveness on a daily basis. It's a big challenge, isn't it? And that's what being an imitator of God is. It means to bring in these, these qualities and this attitude of God. We can do that, and it would be a great thing. Here's the second one. Second one, Paul says, and he doesn't say it quite like I'm going to say it, but it's there. And he says this. Let the Bible verses 
that you know and treasure really take life in your spirit. Let the Bible verses that you know and that you treasure just really take life in your spirit. Call on them uh, and, and live by them. Uh, one time uh, during my experience in theological education, I helped a group go to a conference led by a name that many of you will recognize, Dr. Fred Craddock. Dr. Craddock was well known in the Baptist tradition, also well known in Presbyterian circles and tradition. Esteemed preacher and, and servant. And interestingly, the theme of the conference was this very theme, imitators of God. Here was a seminary auditorium filled up with young preachers, ministers. And, and the theme was, be imitators of God. Act like God. Do the things God wants you to do. And he told the story. He told the story. He told the story about a lady by the name of Mrs. Emma Sloan. Mrs. Emma Sloan said Dr. Craddock was my Sunday school teacher as a child. He said, we don't do this much anymore, but on every Sunday, she would have the boys and girls in our class uh, recite Bible verses by the alphabet. And we'd do it every Sunday. A, a soft answer turns away wrath. B, be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as in Christ God has forgiven you. And that's in our text this morning, isn't it? C, cast all your cares upon the Lord, for He cares for you. D, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. E, enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his holy name. F, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Don't worry, I'm not going any far. <laughs> but I could. And yes, there is a cue. Quench not the spirit. And there is a Z. Zion shall praise God forever. Dr. Craddock turned to those seminarians, those young ministers, men and women, and he said to them, nothing, nothing has meant more to me in my life as a minister trying to emulate God than to remember those Bible verses that Mrs. Emma Sloan taught me as a little boy. You could have heard a pin drop in the place or a cell phone ring. <laughs> so learning to imitate God, learn to forgive and practice forgiveness daily. And number two, lift up the Bible verses that are special to you and make them live in your heart. Choose one. Dr. Credit says, I, I choose one a day. I, I, I'll choose C sometimes. Cast all your cares upon the Lord for he cares for you. Or I'll try to practice the golden rule to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Nothing, he said, nothing has helped me to be an imitator of God than to let those Bible verses live in my spirit. And it's still true today. I don't know if you're interested in the Bible verses by the alphabet, but I have copies available to you. Uh, the ushers will have them following the worship service today if, if you would like to have a copy. Imitating God. And then the third thing Paul lifts up here when he reduces all these down is that we learn to forgive and practice it daily. And then we let those Bible verses that are special to us really, really live in our spirit. Which ones are special to you? And number C, 
He says, this one won't surprise you. You heard it in the text. Let love and not bitterness live in your heart. There's a verse in Proverbs that says bitterness dries the bones. I don't know that I've ever seen that happen. But I think maybe I have seen evidence of sometimes that kind of thing happening. When you let bitterness just take over your spirit. Paul says to imitate God, let love, let love guide your actions. Not long ago, I saw a report remembering or thinking about and honoring a late CBS News reporter named Dan Rather. Some of you remember him. Some of you are too young to remember him. He covered Pope John Paul and was... They showed a a photograph when he was interviewing the late Pope when Pope John Paul was quite ill. And one of his last wishes, some of you may know a lot more about this than I do, was to go see Mahatma Ali Ajka, the Turkish zealot who had fired the bullet into the Pope. Mahatma was caught, arrested, sentenced to life in prison, and the Pope wanted to go see him before he got much uh, worse. Nobody wanted him to do it. He finally gained permission to do it. There were some rules. Mahatma would have to stand at the back of the cell. Pope John Paul would have to stand out here. And that's how it all started. And I guess the Holy Spirit just fell on the place. Because the Pope said to Mahatma, I wanted to come and see you. Earthly justice prevails. Yes, and it should. But as far as it is between God and between me and between you, everything is all right. And there's a picture of the cell door. wonder how the thing got open. And the Pope standing with his arm around Mahatma Aliachka. Let love, not bitterness. Guide your life. Wow. Well, here we are, finishing up Trinity Sunday. We now move into the season after Pentecost and Trinity. The ordinary days, the color is green. It means we grow and we imitate God, I think is our great challenge. Sometimes your parents may have said it to you, or you may have said it to others. Son or grandson, daughter, granddaughter. We want you to live up to your family name. Our name is Christian. What do you say? Let's live up to our family name. To God be the glory. Be imitators of God. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is a perfect one for this message today. I believe it's hymn number 494. Uh, Take my life and lead me, Lord. We invite you to respond in any way that might be appropriate to you as we stand together and sing our final hymn.
I introduced to you moments ago the name of Dr. Fred Craddock. Some of you in your religious tradition identify, remember him. For our benediction today, I want to mention another name that I know that many of you probably will recognize. Known very well in the Baptist tradition, but also known equally well in the Episcopalian tradition. And his name is Dr. John Claypool. Uh, Dr. Claypool wrote a beautiful benediction that I want to share with you this morning. And I understand that he, he uh, used this benediction in most of the services of his church. Here is Dr. Claypool's beautiful benediction. Go now with the feeling that you have been sent by God into the world. As you go, remember that it is by the goodness of God that you have been brought into this world. It is by the grace of God that you have been delivered to this very moment. And it will be by the love of God, fully revealed in Jesus Christ, that will go with you and that you can believe that the Father is with you wherever you Thank you. Always good to see you.